Hello and welcome everyone to the first of this year global policy webinar, Digital Solutions in Stroke Prevention, organized by the World Stroke Organization. This webinar aims to share and discuss the current state of the availability and use of digital technologies for primordial and primary stroke prevention in developed and developing countries with the em emphasis on gaps, practical issues, and solutions. Uh, there will be four presentations, and after there will be left time for questions and answers. We are ex excited to share with you that today we have nearly 800 registered participants. The webinar will be recorded and it will be available on the WSO website just in a few days. You're welcome to send all your questions during the presentations using the Q&A function on the bottom of, of the bottom of your screen. The answering and discussions will be after the presentations. Now it is my pleasure to introduce the chairs of the um, uh, webinar today, Professor Valer Fagan and Professor Jairash Pandian, who are actually the co-chairs of the webinar. Um, the first topic today is digital technologies for primary stroke prevention, overview and solutions, which will be presented by Professor Valerie Fagan, Director and Professor of the National Institute for Stroke and Applied Neuroscience, Faculty of Health and Environmental Sciences at the AUT University of Auckland and Affiliate Professor of Global Health at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I'm Valerie Fagan, Professor of Neurology and Epidemiology at Auckland University of Technology, New Zealand. In my presentation, I would like to share with you the current state of digital technologies for primordial and primary stroke and cardiovascular disease prevention. Here is my disclosure. Stroke is now the second leading cause of death and the third leading cause of disability worldwide. The global cost of stroke is about $1 trillion a year. And over 100 million people are living with the consequences of stroke globally between 2010 and 2015, declining age standardized cardiovascular disease, including stroke mortality rates, started to stagnate across most regions of the world. And several recent population-based studies have documented a trend towards increasing stroke incidence rates in young adults. Importantly, there have been notable global trends over the last decade and in people younger than 70 years towards an increasing proportional contribution of some important risk factors to cardiovascular disease associated dailies, disability adjusted life years lost, such as high systolic blood pressure shown here, high body mass index, high fasting glucose, and high low-density cholesterol. Over the last three decades, there was also a 50% increase in the lifetime risk of stroke. This fast increase in burden and risk of stroke, as well as the increase in proportional contribution of some important risk factors, suggests that currently used primary stroke prevention strategies are not sufficiently effective. But what are the opportunities to improve primary stroke and cardiovascular disease prevention? One of the newest innovations that could help in reducing stroke and cardiovascular disease burden are digital health technologies. The World Health Organization emphasizes 
that digital technologies are now integral to daily life. And although there is immense scope for use of digital health solutions, their application to improve the health of populations remain largely untapped. The unprecedented usage growth and potential of digital technologies for improving health has recently prompted the editorial office of Stroke Journal to commission us to write a topical review on digital health in primordial and primary stroke prevention. I would like to share with you the main results of this systematic review. Digital technology for primordial and primary stroke prevention was defined at the mobile, for example, smartphone, computer, or web-based technologies to support the achievement of stroke prevention. Digital technologies for people with established stroke, transit ischemic attack, TIA, or cardiovascular disease were excluded from our analysis. A range of electronic databases in the English language was searched for the last decade. Our literature search resulted in almost 2,500 digital tools currently available for stroke prevention, of which only 20 tools met our inclusion criteria. The inclusion criteria I will show you in a minute. The majority of the identified digital tools were not related to primary stroke, specifically stroke prevention, and of 93 digital tools related to primary stroke prevention, 73 were not based on scientific evidence, were duplicates, focused on individual risk factors, or were designed for general fitness. These are the inclusion criteria we developed for acceptable digital tools for primary stroke and cardiovascular disease prevention. Based on the World Health Organization guidelines for digital health, published in 2019, we proposed five domains and three sets of criteria for basic, advanced, and ideal digital tools for primary stroke and cardiovascular disease prevention. Here you can see the criteria for various levels of scientific evidence, ranging from the scientific accuracy of the prediction algorithm to evidence of cost-effectiveness from a full-scale randomized controlled trial. Obviously, criteria for an ideal digital tool must include criteria for basic and advanced digital tools. The second domain is target population and purpose of the tool. While basic criteria require the tool to be usable by either general public or health professionals, advanced tools need to be usable by both and also contain actionable preventative recommendations. An ideal tool also needs to be culturally appropriate and apply to a wider range of major non-communicable diseases that share common risk factors with stroke and cardiovascular disease. Scalability, interface, and usability requirements are the two other domains to evaluate the digital tools against. While basic tools' capability is limited to national or regional level, advanced tools need to be scalable on a regional level with the ability to run on virtual machines. And ideal tools need to be multilingual, globally scalable, 
an automatic and semi or semi-automatic in data population or pre-population. The fifth and final domain is the level of interactivity and engagement with the user. This domain applies only for advanced and ideal tools. While advanced tools require preset notifications, at least one motivational technique and graphical visualization of risks and progress in risk control, ideal tools need to have user-manageable notifications, employ two or more motivational techniques, be interactive, and also have graphical visualization of progress in achieving agreed targets and goals. Of the 20 digital tools identified, only two apps, specifically Heart Score and Stroke Riscometer, and one web app prevents, shown here, met most of the requirements for an ideal mo mobile health primary stroke and cardiovascular disease prevention tool. And of those three, only the stroke riskometer was tested in a randomized controlled trial that demonstrated the feasibility, acceptability, and preliminary efficacy of the app and only two apps, Stroke Riscometer and Prevents, are specifically designed for both primary and secondary stroke prevention and applied motivational primary prevention strategy, regardless of the level of stroke or cardiovascular disease risk. Therefore, bridging the gap between high absolute cardiovascular disease risk and population-wide primary prevention strategies. The stroke and acute coronary syndrome prediction algorithms in the two our digital tools, Stroke Riscometer app and Prevents web app, were derived from the Framingham Heart Study prediction algorithms and enhanced to include several additional major, mainly lifestyle risk factors, shown to be important for stroke and cardiovascular disease occurrence. Inclusion of additional risk factors is also justified from a public health perspective because their control allows reduction of the risk of not only stroke and cardiovascular disease, but also other major non-communicable diseases, sharing the risk factors such as diabetes mellitus, renal vascular disease, vascular dementia, and some types of cancer. PREVENTS is a risk assessment, patient management, and decision support software for healthcare professionals that can be connected with the embedded into the existing electronic patient management systems electronic health records or electronic medical record of health care providers or users or they can be used independently. It, uh, it has a range of important domains uh, shown on this slide, ensuring its usability, effectiveness and data privacy protection. Of the digital tools aimed at individual risk factors, we were able to identify thousands of smart watches, mobile applications, wearable digital devices for monitoring physical activity, heart rate, dietary habits, sleep patterns, stress level, aimed at healthy eating, sufficient physical activity, weight control, sleep hygiene, tobacco avoidance, etc. Although all of these tools could be used from the time of fetal development, infancy, and childhood across the lifespan for pre 
primordial stroke prevention, given the time required for testing such interventions and the relative recency of introduction of health-related digital technologies, it is not surprising that we found no evidence from randomized controlled trials supporting the use of these digital technologies specifically for primordial stroke and cardiovascular disease prevention. However, it does not mean that these tools should not be used. On the contrary, as evidenced by a recent systematic review and meta-analysis, many such tools have been validated and confirmed effective for managing individual risk factors for stroke and cardiovascular disease prevention. However, to achieve the best results, such digital tools for pre primary stroke and cardiovascular disease prevention, uh, including primordial prevention, on the individual level, need to be implemented and integrated with the wider population-wide primary stroke and cardiovascular disease prevention strategies. Based on the totality of evidence, in 2020, the World Stroke Organization accepted a declaration on the recommended strategies to be used globally to reduce the incidence of stroke by 50%, and the incidence of dementia by 30%. This declaration and subsequent World Stroke Organization Lancet publications and other publications on primary stroke prevention call for the wide implementation of population-wide and mass individual prevention strategies via widely available and free-to-use motivational e-health technologies, such as the free stroke riskometer app, community interventions, and polypeel for people at risk of stroke. These two digital tools are complementary, I mean stroke riskometer and prevents. They are complementary to each other and ideally should be used in tandem. Healthcare providers use the Prevents web app on their office computers' gadgets, while lay people and community workers use the Stroke Riskometer mobile app on their smartphones and gadgets. There is an option of data transfer from Prevents to Stroke Riskometer app on the pa patient's smartphone. This is what we are expecting to achieve with the wide global use of the apps and their implementation into practice. Basically, with all these measures in place, we expect a similar risk factor shift in the distribution of risk factors as with population-wide primary prevention strategies, with at least a 20% reduction in stroke incidence over a five-year time period. This would allow us to save millions of lives and avert millions of deaths from stroke and other major non-communicable disorders that share common risk factors with stroke. Finally, I would like to share with you a short video that my senior colleague, Dr. Rita Krishnamurthy, and I presented at the award ceremony as winners of the World Health Organization Western Pacific Region Innovation Challenge Competition in April this year. Greetings from New Zealand. Stroke and cardiovascular diseases are the leading cause of death and disability in the world, and their increasing burden across the globe strongly suggest that currently used primary stroke and cardiovascular disease prevention strategies are not sufficiently effective. All clinicians appreciate the importance of primary stroke and cardiovascular disease prevention, 
but they simply have no time to individualize and document or monitor the recommendations and progress in the effectiveness of primary prevention of their patients. Enabling this would significantly enhance primary prevention and decrease disease burden. But currently, there is a big gap. There are no evidence-based tools doctors and people in the community can use to do this. Therefore, the overarching problem we are trying to solve is to reduce stroke and cardiovascular disease burden across the globe by means of innovative, far-reaching primary stroke prevention digital solutions. Our National Institute for Stroke and Applied Neurosciences of Auckland University of Technology, New Zealand, together with other national and international experts in stroke, primary care, and public health, has developed and validated two unique digital tools to address primary stroke and cardiovascular disease prevention. Based on famous Framingham Heart Study algorithms and international evidence-based guidelines, these tools are Stroke Riscometer app for lay people and Prevents web app for clinicians. Currently, the free-to-use stroke riscometer app is translated in 19 languages and available in over 100 countries for 5.3 billion people in their native languages. For those with poor access to medical services, it may be the only reliable source of information about stroke, cardiovascular risk factors, and how to manage them. Another unique digital tool we recently developed and successfully tested in 27 countries is the Prevents web app. The Prevents web app takes only a couple of minutes to be completed. It provides editable, patient-tailored recommendations for primary stroke prevention for the individual. It shows the patient's five and 10 year absolute and relative risks of stroke and heart attack and specific risk factors. It also shows their progress over time for patients in both narrative and graphical formats, so it's easy to understand. There is also a goal setting option. Then the clinician can save the data on a secure server of the health organization and print them out for the patient. The system also allows analysis of the data and integration with the stroke riscometer app and electronic databases. Currently, there are no other digital tools that provide these capabilities. Our estimates show that with the global use of these two digital tools, it would be possible just over five years to reduce stroke incidents by 20%, avert at least 300 million deaths, and reduce the incidence of other major non-communicable diseases with common risk factors, such as ischemic heart disease, dementia, diabetes mellitus, and even some types of cancer. Needless to say, it would save global economy billions of dollars. This is time to act and implement these digital tools into practice. We, we would, would like, like to thank you for your, your attention. attention. The second topic today uh, is practical issues and experience of using digital technologies for primary stroke prevention by health volunteers. The presenter is uh, Professor Jairash Pandyan, part of the Department of Neurology, Christian Medical College, Lithuania, India, and Vice President of the World Stroke Organization. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm going to talk on practical issues and experience of using digital technologies for primary stroke prevention by healthcare volunteers. I received funding from Indian Council of Medical Research. In the interstroke case control study, there are top 10 risk factors you know, for stroke and which are all modifiable. The previous history of hypertension, regular physical activity, diet, 
high street ratio, psychosocial factors, current smoking, cardiac causes, alcohol consumption, and diabetes mellitus. So 90% of the stroke risk factors are modifiable. So this slide shows the various modalities of prevention, that is the primordial, primary, and secondary. I'll be talking on primary and secondary prevention, particularly focusing on uh, digital technology, the mobile health, and task shifting and uh, task sharing with strategies uh, to improve ad adherence to medications like uh, polypers. So digital technology and community health workers, how can we use uh, uh, these two uh, methods to prevent stroke. So if you, this slide shows the summary of some of the earlier you know, polypill trials, which focused on adherence to medication, control of blood pressure, etc. And clearly it shows that there is improvement in adherence to medications in the various polypill uh, trials. But the large scale study, um, that is a polyiron trial, where um, they looked at the effectiveness of polypill for primary and secondary prevention of cardiovascular diseases. This was a pragmatic cluster randomized trial, which was done in a population of 50,000 and aged 40 to 75 years. And they had two arms, um, and that is the intervention arm and the minimal care group. In the minimal care group, uh, the auxiliary healthcare personnel, they went to the houses of the people and they taught them about various lifestyle risk factors, how they can change uh, proper diet, physical activity, regularly taking medications and uh, cessation of smoking, alcohol, etc. In the intervention arm, they had uh, the polypill plus the lifestyle changes advice. So the polypill that aspirin, atorvastatin, hydrochloric acid, and either enolapril or velsatin. And the, in, the inter, in the intervention arm, uh, um, there were uh, 120 clusters uh, and about uh, 3,421 participants um, were uh, randomized to polypal group. And in the minimal care group, 116 clubs, clusters and 3,417 were randomized to minimal care group. And in the intervention arm, this, besides the polypill and lifestyle changes, they also received uh, uh, text messages, SMS, uh, twice a month, and uh, which focused on medication adherence and lifestyle changes as well. So what did they find? And uh, there was a dramatic reduction in major cardiovascular events, is about 5.9% versus 8.8% in, uh, in the minute in intervention that the polypill group versus the minimal care group. And if you look at uh, uh, patients who were restricted to uh, adherence of high adherence of medication, the risk reduction was greater as compared to the minimal care group. If you look at the adverse events, they were almost similar. 20 intracranial hemorrhages were reported, five years follow-up, 10 in the polypill group, 11 in the minimal care group and uh, the upper GI bleeding you know, was more in the polypill group. So the NNT uh, uh, to re reduce one cardiovascular event was 34.5. There's another trial, HOPE4, which is a cluster randomized trial, which was done in Malaysia and Colombia. Uh, in, uh, it was a community-based uh, trial where people with new onset of hypertension or poorly controlled hypertension from 30 communities were randomized to usual care versus uh, intervention. So intervention, the non-professional healthcare workers, they were given a tablet, which was which had an algorithm and a counseling program. So, um, and the free hypertension medication as well as statin medication were given with the support of the physicians. And there was a um, you know, family member support and also um, friends or relatives uh, to improve the adherence to medication. So in the primary outcome, the, the reduction in Framingham risk score for 10-year cardiovascular risk was about 6.4% in the intervention arm as compared to, uh, sorry, in the control arm as compared to 11.1% in the intervention arm. So the difference was about 4.7%. And there was a, uh, in addition to that, there was a reduction in blood pressure and LDL. 
So there's a small uh, um, cluster randomized pilot trial which was done in Ghana in about 60 soak survivors. They used a smartphone with a blue Bluetooth device to self-monitor and reporting the blood pressure measurement, including the medication intake for three months. So they were able to show uh, that um, uh, the control of blood pressure, the target was less than 140 millimeters of mercury. In the intervention arm, about 66% of them, um, where the BP was below 140 as compared to 46% of the control group. The medication adherence was also better in the uh, intervention arm. There's another uh, large trial which, is, uh, which has been completed um, from central part of India in a rural area where they trained community health workers for screening of diabetes, hypertension and stroke and they were referred to mobile clinics and monthly visits by community health workers is a 3.5 years follow up. The primary outcome was reduction in stroke mortality. The results are still awaited from this important uh, um, RCT. There's a trial which was done in China and India in about 47 villages. Um, it's called SIMCARD trial, where 2,000 odd high risk, uh, high cardiovascular risk individuals over 40 years of age with self reported coronary artery disease, stroke, diabetes, um, and they were randomized. This was a cluster RCT where the community health workers were given a mobile phone Android which had an algorithm for screening uh, educational lifestyle factors and it was a one-year follow-up. The medications were given in uh, liaising with the local physicians. So um, the intervention was BP medication, aspirin, smoking cessation, and salt reduction. So they were able to show that um, the primary outcome of about 26% increase in use of antihypertensive drugs and in the secondary outcome, they in, uh, there was an increase in use of um, aspirin and also reduction in systolic blood pressure. So moving on to uh, secondary prevention from some of the work that we have done. So we uh, did a large um, um, urban and rural population based stroke registry. From the rural population based stroke registry cohort, uh, uh, we wanted to do a secondary prevention trial by training ASHAs, that is the accredited social health activities, there's an ASSIST trial. But the first phase we trained about 220 ASHAs. Uh, for over a period of three months and then we looked at the pre and post uh, retention uh, and uh, they were uh, taught about risk factors, uh, BP, how to measure blood pressure, blood glucose, rhythm monitoring, etc. And this was a cluster RCT. We had a cluster size of 7,900 and about 100 in each. Um, the blinded assessor uh, uh, evaluated the blood pressure, blood sugar, um, and, uh, and also at six months, the primary outcome was reduction in blood pressure. So, uh, what we found in the rural population based stroke registry is a high proportion of uncontrolled hypertension in, in, our, uh, um, in our stroke patients in the villages. So, these are two sites with a population, total population of 250,000, and this is, these are the ASHAs which were trained in one of the primary health care centers and the, another community health care center. This is, uh, these are the ASHA that were trained. So what did we give? We gave a small kit, uh, what we call a stroke stock kit, and uh, which had uh, a manual about stroke and basics of stroke. And uh, also they had a smartphone with a video calling facility and a blood sugar monitoring and a BP monitoring device. So when uh, the ASHAs visited their homes, um, they, after measurement, they did a, they uploaded the report and they did a video calling with the treating neurologist and Dr. Mahesh Pate, who was my colleague, was a PI for this particular cluster RCT. So the basal characteristics, characteristics were almost similar except for a higher systolic blood pressure in the intervention cluster and uh, um, so what did we find? There was a gross reduction in uh, systolic blood pressure at six months and uh, even diastolic blood pressure, a reduction in blood glucose. So, so using ASHAs, we were able to demonstrate that uh, blood pressure can be controlled, glucose can be controlled. 
So moving on to a larger uh, randomized control trial, uh, what we call a SPRINT trial, uh, the second intervention was structured semi-interactive stroke prevention package in India. Uh, this was done in the Indian Stroke Clinical Trial Network with support from ICMR. I had presented the results in the large clinical trial section of the ESOC uh, conference that was held in May uh, last month. So there's a high burden of stroke in our country, more so in the recurrent strokes. The recurrent stroke uh, rates range from 13 to 21 percent. And this is because of the large population in India and also the high prevalence of risk factors. So we aim to reduce recurrent stroke, acute coronary syndrome, and deaths in patients with subacute stroke with the help of uh, SMS, video message, and workbook. So this was a multi-centered, randomized, parallel design and blinded endpoint trial of subacute stroke patient. We recruited patients who were 18 years of age with first ever stroke. Uh, between two days to three months and uh, with the MRS of two to five at the time of enrollment and they were required to have a personal uh, mobile cellular device. The availability of caregiver was essential if the patients had aphasia or if they were illiterate in order to you know, re uh, view the messages and read the messages as well as complete the workbook task. So patients in the intervention arm uh, received uh, regular text messages to promote uh, uh, the control of risk factors and medication adherence, um, uh, text messages as well as videos uh, uh, regularly. So 70 text messages daily for six weeks, twice weekly for six months and weekly for the remaining period and the six videos uh, weekly for the first six weeks followed by monthly videos for the remaining period. In addition, they were uh, asked to complete a workbook with uh, which had 14 chapters and uh, translated in 11 Indian languages. And they had to complete one exercise every week for six weeks and revision every one month. So in intervention arm patients, uh, they had a weekly call for first six weeks and thereafter uh, monthly and six months and then six months and one year, the follow-up was at six months and one year. The control arm patient received standard of care management, follow-up, um, and the monthly telephonic calls to enter about the vascular events and uh, regular follow-up at six months and one year. The primary outcome was a composite endpoint of recurrent stroke, high-risk TIA, acute coronary syndrome, and death. And there were a variety of secondary outcome measures like BP, blood sugar, cholesterol, smoking, uh, and alcohol cessation, physical activity, and medication adherence, uh, and also modified ranking scale. So we calculated the sample size based on a 3% reduction um, in the composite endpoint from 20% in the control arm to 17% in the intervention arm, which amounted to total sample size of 5,830 patients. We used the intention to treat analysis. So the trial was done in 31 centers of the Indian Stroke Clinical Trial Network. The results. So we screened about 5,640 patients, randomized 4,298 patients, uh, 2,148 in the intervention arm and 2,150 in the control arm. And uh, uh, about 1,500 patients in both arms uh, completed one year follow up with the last two follow up, but only less than 1.5% in both the arms. So the trial was uh, affected um, during the COVID pandemic, uh, the two waves, but however, we were able to um, continue the recruitment. So this slide shows the baseline characteristics, which was well matched uh, in terms of age, gender, type of uh, smartphone, uh, the type of mobile phone, education, medication history, uh, stroke subtype, and also stroke severity. So primary outcome did not differ in both the groups uh, and the, there were fewer vascular events recorded in both the groups. However, in, in certain lifestyle factors uh, like current alcohol intake, current smoking, alcohol cessation, smoking cessation, and adherence to medication was better in the intervention harm. Uh, in all the other secondary outcome measures like functional, functional outcome, blood pressure, blood sugar, lipid profile, and physical activity, there was no difference between both the groups. So we looked at the fidelity of the intervention using process evaluation. Uh, 
Um, and uh, the intervention fidelity questionnaire was completed by about 66% of the patients in the intervention arm. Uh, the number of patients who, who viewed the SMS and videos uh, was higher uh, during the first six weeks, which is, which is around 40% at six months and about 35% at one year. And uh, the missed call acknowledgement was in about 17% of the uh, subjects. And the intervention contamination questionnaire filled by the control group, uh, over 87% of them, none of them reported any knowledge of uh, coming across uh, the intervention material. The number of workbook activities, um, out of the 15, the median was 9. So there was a good amount, I would say moderate to high level of intervention fidelity. The strength is a large RCT and we developed the intervention package in 12 Indian languages using a formative research methodology which itself took about one year to uh, develop in about 12 languages. And there was a minimal loss to follow up, less than 1.5%. We use a fidelity assessment. There was a low vascular event rate, maybe because of a younger population that we have, and maybe a longer follow up would have uh, helped us to have or capture more vascular events. And of course, there was an effect of pandemic in terms of uh, uh, documenting the outcome. And acknowledgement of uh, SMS and videos was uh, low in the trial. So structured semi-interactive stroke prevention package did not reduce the risk of vascular events compared to standard care. And implementing lifestyle factors and medication compliance is promising and may have long-term benefits. So ML interventions um, in detection of recurrent stroke and cardiovascular events is said to be good. So what are the challenges you know, you know, of using digital technology particularly using community health workers for stroke prevention. We need to do it at a large scale. So for that, you need to get the support from the local government. And in LMICs, the challenge is you need to um, um, train the, the, these healthcare workers in the regional languages. And that itself is a huge task. You need to translate the materials and then uh, uh, train the healthcare workers Another important challenge is to um, the retention of education content, whether they are able to retain what has been taught, and how frequently we can send these educational mess messages you know, in whatever form that we use, whether it's text messages, videos, or uh, education leaflets, how frequently we can uh, send that. And what is the best method? The text messages, videos, leaflet. From the SPIN trial, what we found out from the process evaluation is videos are better and more, accept more acceptable as compared to text messages. And most important thing is the internet connectivity if you're using a digital technology. So in conclusion, prevention of stroke using digital technology is possible using community health workers. Various strategies can be adapted, polypal, ML, task shifting, we can use different modalities like tablets, smartphones, text messages, videos, apps, and educational print materials. So there is definite evidence for control of blood pressure, blood sugar, medication adherence, and certain lifestyle risk factors. But long-term detection of cardiovascular events and stroke is still to be proven. I sincerely thank the Instruct collaborators, the steering committee members, DSCB members, investigators, national coordinating team, site coordinators, and ICMR, and more importantly, patients and relatives for the Sprint India trial. And acknowledgement to my uh, Department of Community Medicine, who, um, along with Dr. Mahesh Kate, who executed the cluster randomized trial, the Rural Population Based Stroke Registry, with support from ICMR, WSO, and WFN. And I finally thank my uh, Christian Medical College with the Anna Comprehensive Stroke Program team, the entire research staff and other staff who have been involved in various projects. Thank you. The third topic today is digital technologies for primordial stroke prevention. Primordial and societal approach will be presented by uh, Mayowa Uolawabi, 
Professor Lead, co-chair of the World Stroke Organization, World Health Organization, and Lancet Neurology Commission on Stroke. Good day, everyone. You are most welcome to this World Stroke Organization Global Policy Webinar. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak on a very, very, very important uh, topic, which is the use of digital technologies for stroke prevention. I will be discussing the primordial and societal approach. I have no conflict of interest. The global burden of disease studies have shown that the burden of stroke in terms of incidence, prevalence, and deaths, the absolute numbers, are increasing rapidly across the globe, with more than 85% increase in prevalence over three decades. And the global cost of stroke is up to nearly a trillion dollars annually. So we need to do something drastically to reduce this burden. The lifetime risk of stroke has also increased tremendously from one in six chance to one in four chance of having stroke in a lifetime. So there are four pillars of the stroke quadrangle and that is surveillance, prevention, acute care and rehabilitation. Today we are focusing on prevention as one of the most veritable tools to reduce the burden of stroke. And my talk is going to be focusing on primordial prevention, which is different from primary, secondary and tertiary prevention. Primordial prevention embraces or includes activities that prevent the occurrence of stroke risk factors that target the prevention of stroke risk factors from even imagine in the first instance whereas primary prevention are activities that are aimed at early detection and control of risk factors for stroke when those risk factors have already uh, developed so uh, my talk today will be focusing on primordial prevention which is actually the most challenging but perhaps the most important and most likely also the most useful um, targeting just acute care rehabilitation would only help us to deal with the tip of the iceberg because the population at risk of stroke is enormous and multiple times bigger than those who already developed stroke. And that is why we are focusing on primary and primordial prevention. So they are really very, very critical tools to reducing the global burden of stroke and indeed other cardiovascular diseases, which share similar risk factors. In order to develop interventions for primordial prevention of stroke, it is critically important to understand the risk factors for stroke themselves and, uh, and the pathway to stroke occurrence. The first layer of risk factors, which are fundamental and foundational, includes non-modifiable factors like age, sex, and genetic factors. Increasing age is associated with uh, the risk of stroke, for instance. And genetic factors for stroke have been unraveled through uh, different uh, uh, efforts and initiatives, including polygenic risk scores and so on and so forth, because stroke is a complex trait and is a polygenic disorder. Then there are sociocultural, educational, income, environmental, and political determinants, which eventually influence behavioral and lifestyle factors, such as tobacco, uh, stress, air pollution, dietary factors, such as consumption of red meat, uh, added salt to diet, reduced and low consumption of vegetables and fruits, alcohol consumption, and physical inactivity. So all of these factors interact to lead to the intermediate risk factors like hypertension, dyslipidemia, obesity, overweight, glucose intolerance, which together can cause atherosclerosis, 
And eventually, this then leads to uh, the endpoints, coronary artery disease, pro peripheral vascular disease, several cancers, and COPD. And this is why, because of the shared risk factors, that primordial prevention of stroke as a collateral beneficial effect of preventing other non-communicable diseases. And so this is critically important. So primordial prevention is targeted at these points, preventing these risk factors from leading to the, uh, these factors from leading to the intermediate risk factors, and uh, uh, also preventing because some of the intermediate risk factors can also lead to those intermediate risk factors. For instance, dyslipidemia and obesity may be associated with hypertension and vice versa. And of course, all of these may be associated with atherosclerosis and kidney disease. So there is an interplay between policy, political context, socioeconomic context, governance, uh, social position, education, occupational income, uh, ethnicity, race, and uh, influence on behaviors and lifestyle and biological and psychosocial factors. And this affects the distribution of uh, well-being. So the risk factors can be grouped into behavioral, metabolic, and environmental. Smoking, poor diet, low physical activity, hypertension, obesity, dyslipidemia, uh, and reduced GFR, and environmental factors like air pollution, uh, ambient particulate matter pollution, and lead exposure. And uh, these are categorized uh, and ranked uh, for different world regions and globally. And we can see that obesity, hypertension, uh, dysglycemia, smoking are really very very important across the globe and uh, in africa we find that consumption of uh, vegetable green leafy vegetable daily consumption protects against uh, stroke whereas uh, red meat consumption uh, salt consumption and uh, income strata of uh, between 100 and uh, 250 dollars a month uh, increases the chances of stroke. We've summarized the effect of diet on stroke in this uh, newly accepted or uh, published uh, work from our team on the, on the interaction between dietary factors and stroke. And uh, you'll find that vegetable dense diet are protective against stroke, followed by whole grain and fruits. Whereas meaty diet uh, is a risk factor uh, for stroke. So uh, primordial prevention must utilize a life cause approach to target individuals who are yet to develop the risk factors for stroke. And so susceptible individuals may need to be targeted before they develop uh, the risk factors for stroke. And therefore, this requires controlling of the fetal environment, even in utero. And maternal and child death is also very important. Of course, early childhood is also very, very important because this is when uh, habits like sedentary living, like uh, uh, dietary habits are imbibed. So it is good for individuals at very early age to cultivate uh, the habit of a of healthy lifestyle, avoiding uh, tobacco exposure, alcohol, and imbibing consumption of green leafy vegetable, healthy diet, uh, uh, low salt, and avoiding things that could lead to other stroke risk factors. It's also possible to use the tools of multiomics and precision medicine to identify preclinical biomarkers of those risk factors before they develop, so that individuals that have propensity of developing those risk factors can also be targeted for primordial prevention. So primordial prevention uh, is an emerging entity. Even though it is utopian, it's perhaps the ultimate means for reducing the burden of chronic diseases. And it is aimed at extending not just lifespan, but also the health span. 
there is a limited evidence for it but evidence continues to uh, grow and um, for primordial prevention examples of holistic approaches would include tobacco control fcts and uh, LD diet. A whole society approach is required using the behavioral change model. And that includes looking at guidelines, looking at environmental and social planning, looking at education, persuasion, communication, marketing uh, of uh, LD lifestyle practices, legislation to prevent uh, to prevent uh, habits that are that could be damaging, like uh, cigarette smoking, service provision to educate people about what they need to do to prevent the risk factors for stroke, regulation, fiscal measures, uh, guidelines, and so on and so forth. So stroke control particularly primordial prevention must factor all of this to motivate the individual and provide opportunity for positive change and give them the capability both psychological and otherwise to be able to implement primordial interventions for stroke prevention so the who has a framework for tobacco control which includes reducing demands reducing supply and there is a policy package that monitors tobacco use, protects people from tobacco, offer, offers help to, to quit and warn about the dangers of tobacco and enforce bans on advertisement, promotion, sponsorship, and of course, raising taxes. Another very important aspect of primordial prevention is nutrition. Population level and individual level interventions that target nutrition for the primordial prevention of stroke is very crucial. So taxes on foods that are risk factors, that constitute risk factors for, for stroke uh, are very important. Uh, things like fatty, fried food, um, junk food, salty, red, salty food, red meat, sugar sweetened beverages, you know, these are already been implemented in some countries like Mexico, Mexico uh, has implemented tax on sugar beverages. So population-wide, healthy food value chain is also important to provide healthy alternatives across the value chain for food that is fresh and healthy, and then incentives for healthy food production and consumption, as well as uh, salt substitutes to prevent hypertension. So for the dietary aspect, which also improves overall brain health, Micronutrient intake, plant based diets are to be encouraged. And moderate energy consumption and low meat consumption are important to avoid obesity and avoid atherosclerosis and disease consumption. Another very, very important pillar of primordial prevention is LD Cities, the LD Cities initiative of the WHO, which includes considerations that will influence lifestyle community first of all the global ecosystem the natural environment the built environment activities uh, local economic community and lifestyle that will target people across the life course and uh, in different areas that will ensure different aspects of healthy lifestyle for instance targeting active transport in built environment to ensure, and then of course in schools one now physical activity in schools uh, for each student every every day is very important. Plan cities according to population's health requirements. Design that encourages walking, safe walkways and cycling paths. More green spaces for recreation, walkable neighborhoods, increasing the number of public transport options and, and thereby decreasing the amount of time spent in private vehicles reducing exposure to pollution, access to fresh and healthy food, equitable access to education and health care. These are all very important. So evidence is building for these interventions, but there is actually very limited evidence for the use of digital technologies to promote primordial prevention. 
uh, but this is something that is becoming important. Uh, the WHO, of course, supports uh, ELT, and ELT tools can be used for primordial prevention of stroke and related communicable disorders. And this is because of the mobile phone, phone and digital resolution. Uh, as you can see, even in low and middle income countries, uh, there is a very, very high proportion of individuals that have access to phones, including mobile phones, and spend uh, hours every day on social media. So digital technology ecosystem for primordial stroke prevention can include digital tools that target health professionals as well as digital tools that target uh, lay people that helps them to imbibe a healthy lifestyle, educate them about um, uh, diet and help them to monitor their diet as well as help them to monitor their activity level. Uh, wearables, uh, digitized research and educational tools and so on and so forth. And I'll give a few examples of those. For physical inactivity, smartwatches are very useful to monitor physical activity up to 7,000 steps or more per day. Sleep hygiene, sedentary lifestyle, wearable digital devices, of course, helps with physical activity monitoring, weight loss, activity trackers, uh, uh, dietary habits, diet trackers, and calorie counters, uh, and so on and so forth. And social media groups to help with tobacco uh, uh, smoking uh, quitting, uh, as well as mobile phone video messaging. These are all very important and can be deployed. Examples include Fitbit, which has shown preliminary efficacy in increasing daily active hours and daily total steps. And there are a huge number of users and this is increasing. So a systematic review uh, found that concomitant reductions in weight, uh, body mass index, you know, uh, has been found, and of course, re reduction in uh, in um, Framingham's risk score uh, has been found in those uh, who use uh, digital tools. So we need to come up with new digital tools by identifying what the needs are and which risk factors we want to target, and develop trials to validate them. Uh, and confirm their efficacy, and then translate them with political, legal, ethical, and, and uh, socioeconomic considerations, and target them to the entire stakeholders, entire range of stakeholders, spectrum of stakeholders, physicians, patients, populists, payers, policymakers, and um, implementation partners, and then evaluate their impact and, uh, and, and implementation barriers and then continue on this cycle until we are really able to utilize them to promote primordial prevention across the globe. We also need to set up ecosystem that involves all stakeholders at different levels to promote primordial prevention of uh, stroke and its risk factors through digital tools. So there is a growing evidence and adoption of and acceptance of digital technologies for primordial prevention of stroke and related NCDs. And it's perhaps one of the most promising strategies to reduce stroke burden across the globe. However, the evidence is limited and RCTs are required and perhaps even newer devices are required uh, to take this forward. And implementation science research is very critical in ensuring uptake uh, and impact. So an integrated approach is required. All society approach, integrated approach, that targets uh, not only stroke but also other NCDs. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I want to thank the Wasbrook Organization, the Lancet Neurology Commission, WSO, uh, WHO Commission on Stroke, and of course the WSO uh, Global Policy Committee. Thank you so much. Uh, enjoy the rest of the webinar and uh, do all you can within your powers to promote the use of digital tools for the primordial prevention of stroke and send the message around to all possible stakeholders and be an ambassador to canvas this change.
Thank you so very much. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Last speaker today, which is Professor Sheila Martins, stroke neuro neurologist, president of uh, Brazilian Stroke Neurology and president-elect of the World Stroke Organization. Her topic today is holistic approach for digital primary stroke prevention experience from Brazil. So the increased burden of stroke and dementia provides strong evidence that currently used primary prevention strategies are not enough. The main outcomes for cerebrovascular disease is cognitive impairment. Only to treat the high-risk patients don't decrease the incidence of stroke or cardiovascular disease. The increased risk of cardiovascular disease is not restricted to those with hypertension or hypercholesterolemia, but is continuous since a blood pressure of 115 per 75 and total cholesterol level of 135. There is evidence of reduced stroke risk and mild cognitive impairment after reductions of blood pressure and changes in cholesterol and lifestyle, including a health interventions in middle-aged individuals at high risk of cardiovascular disease. To reduce 2.5 millimeters of mercury in systolic blood pressure can reduce 10% of stroke incidence. Early identification of patients with a low to moderate risk of cardiovascular disease, along with drug and lifestyle strategies, may prevent the occurrence of stroke and dementia. 80% of strokes and cardiovascular disease occur in people with low to moderate risk. There is a pressing need to identify new, well-tolerated, and accessible strategies for this majority of people that reliably reduce risks in all countries of the world. One in four of us will have a stroke in our lifetime, but we can decrease the risk 9% if you control 10 main modifiable risk factors. So why the burden is so big? We have a lack of knowledge of the population about the risk factors and treatments, low adher adherence to treatments, lack of adequate medical assistance, lack of recognition of risk factors by the doctors, high cost of medications, lack of adequate primary pre prevention programs. We, say we have several unrecognized and untreated comorbidities or undertreated as hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, and atrial fibrillation. We know what we need to do. Eat better, lose weight, get active, reduce blood sugar, stop smoke, reduce alcohol. But how to implement, how to stimulate people to modify their lifestyle? And we know that we need to identify and treat the comorbidities, but how to identify them in primary care and how to treat them properly. So the suggestion is to use two initiatives integrating a World Health Organization, Pan-American Health Organization initiative called HEARTS program and Cut Stroke Health, that is a World Stroke Organization initiative. The heart has the goal to decrease the cardiovascular events through the control of hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, and lifestyle modification with gradual, slow, and monitored change in the assistance in primary care, focusing on flow charts and simplification of process through protocols. Here are the technical cases of heart program. Age of heart is health style counseling. E is evidence-based treatment protocols, A, access to essential medicines and technology, team-based care, and systems for monitoring the program. 
We have uh, in Latin America, 19 countries implementing Heart Pro Hearts program with more than 600 health services implemented. And we have experience across the globe of implementation of Hearts program. By 2025, the HASP strategy will be the model for risk management of cardiovascular disease, including hypertension, diabetes, and dyslipidemia in primary health care. In about cut stroke in half, published here by World Stroke Organization, this strategy is work with community health workers, including a stroke riscometer, polypill of antihypertensive and statins in middle risk patients that are adults aged 50 to 75 years old with no previous history of stroke, TIA or cardiovascular disease, with systolic blood pressure 120 to 139, with one or more lifestyle risk factors, and with a clinical trial to prove the concept that treat these patients can decrease the burden of stroke and other cardiovascular disease. The propose is to test whether a polypill used alone or in combination with lifestyle modification will reduce the incidence of stroke and cognitive impairment in the population of individuals with low to moderate risk of stroke. We know that the polypill is highly effective, is safe, well tolerated with dropout one to 2% per year, less than one in 10,000 fatal complications with low cost because you can use all drugs without patent. This stroke riscometer uh, will be used to stimulate the population to evaluate the risk in five years and 10 years, the risk of stroke and other cardiovascular disease, to know their own risk factors and to teach them how to modify their own risk factors, evaluating during the time if the risk factors are decreasing, depending on the modification of lifestyle. Also uh, stimulate to know the acute stroke signs and has lectures to teach about the disease. In 2020, during the Global Stroke Alliance, you launch the partnership with World Stroke Organization, World Health Organization, Pan-American Health Organization, and Ministry of Health of Brazil to implement Cut Stroke and Health and Hearts program in Brazil, starting in south of the country, Porto Alegre City. Here we have represented all these institutions. Why to implement in Brazil? We have a country with more than 200 million inhabitants with public health system paid by the federal government to 100% of population, 20% of population have additional private health care insurance. So the population, 80% of population depends on the public health system. We have more than 400,000 strokes per year. The stroke is the second cause of death with more than 100,000 deaths per year. And stroke care in Brazil has improved a lot with the organization of acute stroke care in the last 10 years, but it was not enough to reduce the number of strokes per year. So to reduce the number of strokes, we need to act in primary care. But we have a lot of opportunities, free medication for hypertension, diabetes, and dyslipidemia in primary care. 42,000 basic health units with 144,000 family health teams that have a family doctor, a nurse, a nurse assistant, and five to six community health workers. So we are implementing this program in primary care units. And what are the steps for implementation? We organize a committee with neurologists, cardiologists, family doctors, and health managers choice of eight primary care units to implement a pilot in one city, preparation and adaptation of technical protocols for screening and treatment of hypertension, diabetes, and dyslipidemia based on your heart's program, but with the medication available for free in primary care units in Brazil, implementation of protocol for atrial fibrillation screening with a point of care mobile, EKG recording to evaluate the feasibility in, in the benefit to 
screen these patients, preparation of printed materials for lifestyle modification, implementation of hiscometer app, preparation of an educational course for primary professionals, including community health workers, implementation of decision data collection and monitoring software enriched with artificial intelligence. Here are the meetings with multidisciplinary professionals discussing the protocols and the strategy. Here, the coordination of primary care units, here, this discussion with another states because we will respond to other regions of Brazil. Here, the software to evaluate the patient when arrive in the primary care units with risk factors, blood pressure, and calculating the cardiovascular risk of patient in 10 years. And when they finish this evaluation, the software tell us patient with high risk, patient needs to be evaluated by HEARTS program, or this is a patient for the PROMOTE study, the, that is the study for um, Curtis Stroking Health Project. Here, the cardia to detect atrial fibrillation. Here, the example of a protocol, very easy with decisions and uh, when the patient needs to come back. At the end of the evaluation, the software summarize the data and put in the medical records and also in a dashboard and in a data bank for evaluation uh, of the strategy implemented. The program has a strong educational part for doctors, nurses, and health community workers, including uh, less lessons on how to measure the blood pressure. We are using automatic device for blood pressure. Você sabia que pode estar aferindo errado a pressão arterial? Nesse vídeo, vamos apresentar seis passos para ferir corretamente a pressão arterial usando aparelhos automáticos e uma dica bônus no final. Here is the guide for lifestyle modification. The monitoring six months indicators patients with blood pressure controlled compared with baseline goal increase at least 5% in the first year. Doctors using the recommended protocol, health community workers using the hiscometer, and patients using the hiscometer. In three years, indicators reduce reduction of stroke, myocardial infarction, and cardiovascular death. Uh, the implementation started in August 2021 and will be expanded to 60 units uh, of health in the whole country in 2023. We have now 1,200 patients with initial evaluation and the Minister of Health signed the agreement with Pan American Health Organization in 2021 to implement the HEARTS program in the entire country in meetings in preparation of the national program now. In here to show the study, uh, starting in eight uh, primary care units in Porto Alegre, 1,000 patients in the first part with a surrogated endpoint in nine months to evaluate if the blood pressure decrease and if the cholesterol decrease. And in the second part, six cluster units in the country, 12,000 patients, and they follow up each six months up to 36 months to evaluate the stroke and cognitive decline as the first outcome and secondary myocardial infarction and cardiovascular death. Here, the students are screening the patients by phone. International experts that are part of the design of this protocol in the executive group here, the national group discussing, including cardiologists, primary care physicians, Pan American Health Organization, neurologists, and other. Here, the group working with me in Hospital Munhoz de Vento in these protocols. And we hope that this program can decrease the burden of stroke and other cardiovascular disease in the country and uh, with the same results in other parts of the world. Thank you. So thank you, Sheila, and uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for your uh, very informative presentations. I must apologize on behalf of the SO 
for technical glitches during the presentations. I think much re, uh, relates to the internet connection, uh, maybe weather somewhere in some parts of the world. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> we are talking about digital technologies, <laughs> but uh, our own technology has failed <laughs> during the presentation. But I hope it did not spoil the overall impression and information um, our participants um, received during the webinar. And um, now um, I would like to um, invite everyone uh, to ask their questions. Some questions already been asked. If there are any anyone who wants to ask a question verbally aloud, now please do. Otherwise, we will just read out some of the questions we received. I think, uh, Valeria, I think we can uh, address the questions which have been uh, entered in the chat box. Is it okay? Yeah. 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 I think the first one, uh, it is about uh, app for secondary prevention. Um, I think yes. it was one of the earlier ones. Yeah, I, I think this question is more for me. So uh, yeah. if you yeah. don't mind, um, I will ask. Yeah, you can ask yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Yes, uh, uh, stroke risk commenter app, for example, which is free to use and download, it can be used also for secondary stroke prevention. However, recommendations in the stroke risk commenter app cannot be edited, cannot be person specific. And for that purpose, uh, that's what we developed, um, a web app called Prevents that could provide person specific, culturally specific recommendations based on the already established internationally recognized guidelines for primary and secondary stroke prevention. Unfortunately, there is uh, no uh, such digital tool for clinicians anywhere in the world. I am not aware of any digital decision support tool for clinicians for secondary stroke prevention. So that's the, the, the only one currently we have, and we are testing it in 27 countries for the usability. The first uh, phase of testing has already um, been done, and it showed um, um, very good uh, acceptability, feasibility, and usability score um, among um, um, over six, 60 testers in 27 countries. Next week, uh, we plan to start testing the second um, version of the web app, which been developed based on the recommendations from the uh, first phase testing uh, from testers. So hopefully that tool will be available in in couple months, basically available for use in, in, in all other countries. Uh, so if there are uh, interest in using it, please uh, let me know and we will be in contact with you. So that's very important question, uh, digital tools for secondary stroke prevention. If um, Jay Raju, uh, Shiloh, Mayo would like to add anything to that, please do. We have time. Yeah, I agree fully with, uh, with Valerie. And uh, 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 of course, there are no uh, one particular technology for secondary prevention. It's uh, always in combination with other tools. And uh, the most important thing is you know, the, this factor that we need to identify the training of the people who was going to use it uh, and also the follow up and monitoring. So that is more uh, crucial. I think. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Sheila, would you like to add something? 
Yeah, well, we are using a histometer that is a great tool and we are very excited to start to use the prevent S because I think you help us a lot in the management of the patient. So in the next webinar, I will tell you about it. <laughs> All right. I think the trial that uh, is currently ongoing in Brazil is likely to be a practice life-changing um, trial because it's absolutely unique. Um, huge, very comprehensive, and practice-oriented, which is very important point. It can be rolled out relatively easily in all settings, in all countries, not only high, low-income, middle-income countries. So we're really excited to see the results of that trial, Sheila. Yeah, we do. <laughs> Uh, uh, one more question, Valerie, is on uh, the validation of digital technology and the ethical issues in uh, using this technology, not only for research, but also for monitoring. It's an important uh, uh, aspect of digital technology in healthcare. So you had covered about the validation part very nicely in that uh, uh, the systematic review. And, yeah, uh, uh, digital technology, as we all acknowledged in our presentations, is, is a reality of our life. And World Health Organization strongly recommends to use it for, um, for healthcare purposes, for education of people. In some low income countries where uh, access to primary care is really limited because of the cost of that care, that could be the only tool available to educate people about stroke risk factors, how to control it. And the good thing about these tools is that they all use um, evidence-based recommendations. So there is really no uh, concern that what is recommended needs to be proved in another trial. What is needed to be proved is the mode of delivery of this information. And that's exactly what uh, Sheila is doing. And we're also doing it in Australia, in New Zealand, in a large randomized controlled trial on stroke riskometer. And later on, we plan to do it on prevents. So that, that, that's a uh, task is pending, definitely. One more comment, you know, uh, the implementation at grassroots level and how we can sustain this you know, for a long-term uh, follow-up, particularly if we are looking at documenting the cardiovascular events, you know, we need at least a couple of years. And uh, so we had problems with the Sprint India trial. You know, we kept it for one year because of logistic reasons. And what we found was uh, after six weeks to maybe six months, uh, they're, uh, they have this mental fatigue. So they keep on getting text messages, you know, videos are okay, and workbook. You know, so they get fatigue. Uh, so probably there is a window of period, of, a window of opportunity where we can uh, target them with education. Beyond that, maybe some uh, we can space, the, space out that period you know, rather than doing it very frequently. So uh, many of our patients in the intervention arm they said, why are you calling us again and again? And again? We are doing well. <laughs> so uh, we need to learn from their perspective as well. Yeah. Yes, yes. That's a very important aspect of behavioral interventions, to remain motivated. We all know how difficult it is. Just, I think each of us was trying to go to gym regularly, but after some time, we, we, we stop doing it and then start doing it again. Being motivated is the key to success of behavioral interventions. That's why kind of ongoing regular motivation contacts uh, with the people um, are really important. Mayova, would, would you like to add something about uh, digital tools? for primary prevention? Absolutely, thank, thank you very much. I think digital tools are extremely uh, important because that's how we can reach 
uh, the entire population. And that's also how we can connect with them, you know, from time to time to remind them and to motivate them. And uh, in fact, we can disseminate digital tools to social media and social media groups can also be formed, you know, a support group that, that can continue to give feedback. And people can monitor over time their progress in a, in a graphical manner and, and, uh, and, and then they will know that, uh, you know, they've been making progress or they're not making progress and they know what to do. Uh, so, so it's extremely important. Uh, the other thing I was going to quickly mention was, was that we also need to uh, further uh, enrich the evidence base for the use of digital tools, particularly for primordial prevention, uh, because that's actually the most difficult part. Because uh, the emergence of these risk factors starts from very early in life, and uh, it takes a very long time. So we need to look at interventions that uh, target uh, people from as at, at, at I mean at very very early uh, ages, you know, like when they are children, in pupils in schools, uh, students, you know, and see whether we are able to forestall the development of hypertension, obesity, diabetes, dyslipidemia, which was not there before, but which is happening now because of sedentary lifestyle and some other sociocultural and economic factors uh, that have come to play. So digital tools are extremely important and, uh, and uh, the people who want to target like uh, pupils, students, they are also very, very versatile with digital tools. And even in low and middle income countries and developing countries, people spend hours, like in Nigeria, Nigeria, two hours a day is the, uh, Nigeria is one of the top most uh, yeah, users of, uh, of social media, more than two hours a day on social media. So we could use it to spread this information. The other kind of digital tool we could use, apart from uh, Riscometer, is actually educational tools that enlightens people about stroke, about what they need to do, because a lot of people really do not know why stroke occurs, even up till yeah. now. And if it occurs, they don't know where to go. And then they don't know what risk factors to, to prevent. And in fact, some cultural issues and myths needs to be busted. For instance, obesity is seen as a sign of good living in some communities. But of course, you have to let them know that obesity can be a risk factor for stroke. The other thing I was going to mention that we still need to do research about, uh, the Riscometer app has won awards and is really excellent, it's superb, you know. But the Framiams risk uh, profile on which it is based is not uh, trans translatable to different regions of the world. For instance, in Nigeria uh, and Ghana, we tried to use the Framiam score and we found that it was actually not valid, you know? Uh, so, so we need to probably develop things that are also uh, based on data and risk factor profile, uh, odds ratio and things like that from, from different populations. But I mean, but before that, of, of course, of course, we can still continue to use the risk meter, but that's also something very important uh, to mention as a gap that we need to, to, to fill uh, someday. So digital tools are really important. And, yeah. uh, and, and uh, uh, there are other digital tools that we could use, uh, apart from what can be used on social media, perhaps even screenplays, uh, theater arts, you know, modified theater arts that showcases uh, what needs to be done to prevent stroke and, and things like that and provide continu continuously provide motivation. We need to put stroke and neurological and brain health on the at the center of every discussion, just like the COVID did before. You know, if we're able to do that mm -hmm. and attract that kind of global attention, and this is actually the best time to do it because right now the world is focusing on neurological disorders with the WHO high gap on neurological disorders, you know, and with the NCD uh, issue, which, which can be integrated with stroke care. And stroke is actually a major thing uh, since it's the second leading cause of death and third leading cause of disability and the leading cause of uh, neurological disability. So it's really a major, I mean, uh, major thing we could use to motivate people yeah. for behavioral change. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Mayova. There is uh, uh, one more question I can um, see uh, from the uh, chat uh, section. Uh, the question is about um, economic, uh, health economic benefits of instituting a program of health for, uh, for secondary and primary prevention. Uh, the, 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 there was a paper published in the Lancet, um, I think two years ago, showing that for each dollar investment in primary stroke and cardiovascular disease prevention, the return is $10. Uh, 
ten dollars. In low middle income countries, it is slightly less, seven dollars, but still one to seven cost to benefit uh, ratio. It is enormous. It's very, uh, very effective um, financially. And secondary prevention, uh, there is a number of um, evidence from carotid endorectomy for uh, you know, avoiding uh, recurrent stroke, uh, a lipid lowering therapy, blood pressure lowering therapy. The evidence is overwhelming. It is cost and medically effective. So all these primary and secondary prevention interventions need to be implemented, roll out as widely as possible. There is no question about medical and um, economic benefit of these interventions. And there is one point I would like to emphasize, we, which is um, a position of the World Stroke Organization, and Sheila um, mentioned that, that primary prevention needs to include people at any level of increased risk, not high cardiovascular risk strategy, which is, you know, uh, leaving behind majority of people who develop stroke and myocardial infarction. We need to uh, cover by primary prevention, all people at risk, all people at risk, even start with primordial prevention as Mayova and uh, Jay Raj pointed out. That's the way forward, not to be selective. And we need to um, cover as many people as possible on the population level. So both strategies, population-wide, which is responsibility of the governments and individual strategies, which is responsibility of clinicians, doctors. We need to act on both friend, fronts. There is no yeah. question about that. So I'll just take up another uh, very interesting question on uh, low birth weight infants having a higher incidence of CVD in middle life. Should the WSO be targeting pregnant women? It's uh, a very important uh, question, particularly related to primordial prevention. Uh, I think there's a great opportunity uh, if we work with the government, the uh, maternal and child health care programs at national level. Uh, the, the, this is a very good opportunity to work uh, uh, for in, in the area of uh, primordial prevention. Of course, there is evidence not only for CBD, but also uh, the um, uh, salt sensitivity and the nephrons, the development of nephrons in low birth weight uh, uh, children. And uh, later on, they have a higher incidence of uh, hypertension, even with a little bit of extra salt that they have in the diet. So uh, that's an important area that we need to look at uh, exploring in WSO. So there are a couple of questions on salt reduction. Uh, yeah. yeah, very so good question. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, um, it is absolutely crucial to have uh, legislation about salt reduction in the processed food because 80% of salt we consume are not the table salt. Uh, they are from the uh, processed foods. And without legislative changes, we can change it. Uh, manufacturers would oppose that changes because it's very costly. Uh, they, they would not benefit from such changes, but the population will benefit enormously. And there was a recent paper in the New England Journal of Medicine where just 25% substitution of the salt results in the significant I think about 10% reduction in the incidence of stroke. So that's the strategy to follow. To follow. And I would like to ask Wayne Sandman, who asked that question, to send me a reference uh, to the uh, legislative changes in South Africa, where this legislation was introduced, because we are collecting evidence of the success stories of fighting against stroke. So that would be a really good um, case for us to, uh, to profile uh, through the World Stroke Organization. Please do. 
I think uh, we don't have any more questions. Um, maybe we have already overshot the time. So uh, hope you want to do, Valerie, we will wind up for, with some closing comments from each one of us. Uh, I think oh, John, each John, of us John. could have some summary, <laughs> not right. just me. Um, um, and maybe we, we could start with Sheila. She is the only lady among us. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, it was a, a great pleasure to be here with you to talk about this very important topic. And really, I think we should implement uh, promotion and prevention of stroke in different ways. And of course, salt is important. But as Valerie told, it's very important to all of us, not only for high risk patients, and you should start in children. So uh, join us in this uh, effort to promote and to prevent the stroke across the globe. Thank you for your participation. Thank you, Sheila. And, and uh, Jay Raj? Uh, yeah, uh, so, uh, so my summary is, you no. Know, uh, it's an exciting times that we live in and uh, the digital technology, how we can capitalize this technology for uh, prevention of stroke and uh, there is uh, uh, more and more evidence that is emerging, uh, both in primary and secondary prevention. Primordial also soon will be able to uh, uh, gather more evidence uh, based on the innovative ways of uh, testing uh, uh, these behavioral interventions. And uh, um, I think uh, th that is the road ahead for us in terms of prevention. Even at grassroots level, uh, we can train community health workers in digital technology. That is uh, promising that it, promising uh, thing that is happening in uh, particularly for LMIC. So. Thank you, Jairaj. Uh, Mayova? Yes, thank you very much. I think uh, this is actually the best time for stroke prevention. Uh, there are a lot of global initiatives at the WHO level and the United Nations level that are targeting NCDs. The focus is shifting back to NCDs the world was inundated and uh, overwhelmed with COVID-19, but it actually drew attention to the importance of health as being central to every other aspect of human life, including economy, security, and everything. So having said that, uh, these initiatives, like uh, putting neurology at the very center, uh, even at the WHO, with the WHO Intersectoral Global Action Plan against neurological diseases, the focus on brain health, you know, all of these tied together uh, to draw attention to stroke and the prevention of stroke, uh, which is a very, very, very terrible tool of preventing all the comorbid uh, cardiovascular diseases and indeed uh, cancers. And it starts right from childhood, and therefore it's a multi-sectoral approach that is required that involves our educational system, involves uh, our legislative systems, involves our food value chain, involves uh, um, also uh, uh, several aspects of our, of our life, including design of cities that are healthy, that would allow walkways, uh, green areas for exercise. So all of these are really, really very important. And if we're able to really deal with this, we will not only be able to prolong people's lifespan, we will not only be able to reduce the risk, lifetime risk of developing stroke, but we'll also be able to in increase people's health span. So, and I really congratulate everyone of us for being at the forefront of this, of this crusade. And I'm sure we'll be able to come up with even better digital tools with uh, greater validity, greater spread, greater appeal, and of course, more impact uh, that will really assist us in reaching out to billions of people that are at risk. And I think the only possible way really to reach out to billions of people at risk of developing stroke in our world today is digital too. So we have no choice than to champion this part and make it succeed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayo. I fully agree with all my colleagues about their summaries. I would all only like to add that I am very proud that World Stroke Organization is really leading the fight against stroke and digital technology is a flagship project of the World Stroke Organization, which is 
quite likely to change our practice and really reduce the burden of stroke globally. Uh, uh, this month, there will be two um, important publications coming out from the Lancet Neurology and uh, Lancet Regional Health about uh, digital tools and um, policies of the World Federation of Neurology and World Stroke Organization towards primary stroke prevention, joint statements. So uh, please um, watch the space. I would like to thank again all my colleagues presenters for their wonderful presentations, very informative, and all our participants for their attention and patience with all these technical glitches and for their, for their interest and good questions uh, to us. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, Bye. Yeah, I think the presentations will be on the on the WSO platform for people to see. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.